This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. This week we're celebrating Purim because last week we were in Dallas and had a great time down there. And if you didn't get the uh, video on demand, you need to. There were some great messages down there. Jamie Walden just about burnt the place down. And uh, what you didn't see is me standing in the back with a, with a hanky going, go Jamie, go. It was awesome. I've entitled this, You Have Come Into the Kingdom for Such a Time as This. If you have your Bibles... I want to go to Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, and what I want to look at are some principles that the story of Esther teaches us that will not only be replicated in the last days, but but I believe can be replicated in our daily lives. And this is after it was made clear that Haman planned a day to wipe out every single Jew within the Persian Empire. And God had secretly hid Hadessa, Esther, not only in the palace, but the king was married to her. And now comes crunch time. And we pick up here in verse 13. And Mordecai told, her to, told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now, the story of Esther is really an interesting one. It's one of love, conspiracy, plots, and divine intervention. It's a great story. What's also interesting is Haman is also a perfect type and shadow of the Antichrist, waiting to be revealed. And there's a lot more that we're going to get into about this here in a minute. But I want to deal with some kingdom lessons first uh, out of the Esther story. In Esther chapter 3 and verse 1, and if you can get anything out of this, and there's some long names there, you don't have to remember the long names. But let's read it these ways. And after these things, the king promoted Haman, the Agagite. The Agagite. You need to underline Agagite because they were a peculiar people. They were descendants of the Amalekites. But notice it did not say Amalekite. It said Agagite. You see, one of the things that this generation has lost, especially the millennials, it seems, is there are consequences for all our actions. What we did yesterday sets up what happens today. We create our tomorrows by our obedience to God today. Our disobedience can open up the door to the enemy. 500 years before this event, there was a king of Israel named Saul. And Almighty God said, it's time to take down the Amalekites. I want you to wipe out every single one. Every, and 
the Malachites were not only deep into child sacrifice and the pedophilia, they were also into bestiality. And so God says, I want you to not leave an animal standing, kill all of them, wipe them out. There's, all, there also, there's also evidence that the Amalekites were part Nephilim. That's one of the reasons that uh, when you see when a God says, you know, go over here and you can conquer these people. And there's even, there's even aspects within Torah that if you, if you find a woman, she pleases you and she agrees to walk with God, here are the things that you do to make her your wife. So it, it wasn't, God did not have a scorched earth policy for everybody. It was just for the ones that had of the bloodlines of the giants and the, Amalekite, and the, the Amalekites were one of them. But you see, it was customary among the kings that whenever they conquered a people that they would keep and they would parade the king and queen, although God didn't tell them to do that. And Samuel comes in and he says, how come I hear the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of oxen? And Saul knows he's caught. He said, we were going to make sacrifice for the Lord. And then one of the most quoted scriptures, probably in the Word of God, is obedience is better than sacrifice. That's in the context of this. Now, some have speculated just exactly how the lineage of the king was set free. Did, did, would, you know, did his wife escape? Was she pregnant at the time? There's, I mean, there's a lot of speculation. But several things happen. And I want to first read from the Holman Study Bible, because I thought this was really interesting. Because before this, you know, when, when Haman just had this, uh, he, he hated the Jews, but there was something that put Mordecai in the crosshairs. Because after he was exalted and he was going through the streets, Mordecai refused to bow. Now, what was that all about? Because he would bow to the king. He would not bow to this guy. Holman's Study Bible puts out some really interesting things. One of the most plausible explanations for Mordecai's refusal relates to Haman's name, Haman the Agagite. While Mordecai was possibly of the line of King Saul, Haman was a descendant of Agag, the leader of the Amalekites. King Saul's disobedience in sparing King Agag it resulted in Samuel's announcement that the Lord had taken the kingdom away from him and by extension from his descendants. Possibly this ancient enemy explains Mordecai's refusal to bow to Haman the Agai. In his bowing, he said, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do what my forefathers did. I'm not bowing to an enemy of God. And it set up this whole thing that, that we see happening. Now, in 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 through 23, the prophet Samuel comes on the scene. And it says, and so Samuel said, Hath the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And he doesn't stop there, and to heed than that of the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And there's a whole thing that we can get into the life of Saul if I had time today that Saul was king, but you look at the places where he really got in problems, he either tried to operate as a priest or a prophet. He was operating outside of his office. Now that's, that's a warning for us today in the fivefold ministry. Never step outside your office. Don't just assume certain things. When Saul ended the line of him being king, and how many know it was passed over to David, and Jesus will sit on the throne of David one of these days in Jerusalem, and I'm looking forward to that. But we've got to realize, guys, our obedience to God today. The Bible says that the blessings of a righteous man goes to a thousand generations. How many know even though we were grafted in, you and I are receiving the blessings of Abraham because Abraham believed God when he was an idol maker in Babylon, entrenched in their culture, and God said, I'm the only true God, get out of Babylon. And he believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. 
That's why you and I, we can be like Abraham. We can believe God. We can believe the gospel story. And when we do, just like Abraham, we're called out of spiritual Babylon. Why keeping the commandments are so important is because it's building not only our tomorrows, but the tomorrows of our children and our grandchildren. Now, people can quote me the scripture that God said, I will no longer hold the sins of the fathers against their children. And aren't you glad God isn't? But he didn't say the enemy couldn't. You see, there's two sides to this thing. God said, I won't, but how many know the enemy uses anything that he can get, and he is a legalist. He's portrayed in the Word of God as a prosecuting attorney. But yet this generation doesn't get it. Case in point, I would like for all my student loans to just disappear. Isn't that what all the young people are saying? It doesn't just disappear. It's got to be paid by somebody. And so what you're wanting is you're wanting not only your children to have to pay for it, you're wanting all the people that either were faithful and paid off all their student loans that were under the same debt you were under, or those that became tech or whatever other industry that decided not to go to college, you want them to pay your debt. It doesn't just go away. For some reason, we have several generations that cannot connect what I do today with the consequences of tomorrow. But yet the entire story of Esther is about either disobedience and the consequences of it, or the obedience of one young woman. And because of her obedience, God brought forth deliverance. We need to understand that all of our actions count. What God tells us to do when we do it, I like the blessing. But I like for my children, my grandchildren to even have a greater blessing. That's why I'm trying to be more obedient to God than ever before because I've got grandkids I want to reap from what I'm doing today. Come on now. We set things in motion. One of the, one of the most interesting things about Esau. The Bible says, you know, God looked at Jacob, God looked at Esau, and it said, Jacob he loved, but Esau he hated. But you see, God, when he looks at somebody, he sees them and their, their descendants all throughout time. God saw what Esau set in motion and what his descendants would do. And how many know his descendants were a pain to Israel? And very well may be the extreme jihadists are not children of Ishmael. I think God's getting them like crazy. But it's the descendants of Esau that are going to raise up in jihad against Israel. And he saw what he set in motion. And God hated Esau. I wonder what God is going to do when he looks at us and looks through us to see our descendants. Will there be disappointment or will there be joy? Because God will say, I can work with that. There are consequences. <clears throat> Esther chapter 2 and verse 7. And Mordecai had brought up Hadessah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. For she had neither mother or father. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her <coughs> as his own. She was Hadessah, but all the Babylonians and all the, the, uh, the Persians knew her as Esther. You know, God has the ability to hide you from the enemy when he needs to. God is strategic. And one of the things I'm hearing from so many remnant in our day is why is God not using me now? Why is God not using me now? I feel like I'm in obscurity and I can scream and I can shout and nobody can hear. Well, you may be like John the Baptist, you're stuck on the backside of the desert living among the Essenes out of sight until God releases you. The last thing Haman thought is that the queen was a Jew. Come on now. 
Would you not have liked to have seen his face when the queen says, Haman wants to kill me? Uh, the Night with the King, that movie, we watched it last night. The guy that played Haman, you could see it, it was like, oh no! <laughs> You could see, I mean, he started breaking out in sweat. God has the ability to hide. You know, God has hidden his plan of the end days from all the council of darkness. There's a scene in Revelation where there's the scroll with the seven seals. If you do a little background story on that, that's called the scroll of destiny. Of what the plan that God had even before he created man. He may have even had it before he created Lucifer because he fills all space and time. He knows everything. And it was hidden. Why are there seven seals? Because it's perfectly sealed. Seven is the number of perfection. It's perfectly sealed. The devil, it, the devil can read the book of Revelation and even see what happens when each one of those seals open and still does not have a clue. And I can imagine hell every time a seal is open, they go, oh, poo. <laughs> oh, no. I did not see that coming. We've, we've had thousands of years to plan, and I've not seen that coming. Let me tell you something. If you're in obscurity and God releases you to do what you're supposed to do, the enemy is not going to see you coming. He can, God can keep you in obscurity until he springs you into action. And I tell you what, I think there's a lot of spiritual special forces out there right now that God has them like, like snipers, and they're all camouflaged, just waiting for him to say, pull the trigger. And the enemy's not going to know what hit them. I think we've seen some of them in Wuhan with the outbreak. You know, the secret police were, didn't want to go into Wuhan because it was under quarantine. So you want a lot of Christians did? Now, you're not going to hear this on the mainstream media. They were out with bullhorns preaching the gospel in the streets. They were out trying to deliver food to people. They were praying for people, and people were getting cured of not only the virus, but other ailments they had because God's people, when the enemy flees, the righteous are as bold as a lion. And the communist government is going to have a hard time covering up what God did in Wuhan. I believe when Wuhan is done, we're going to see how many, it's like the body of Christ quadrupled or more in Wuhan. Because there were special forces out there waiting just to be released. That ought to give every one of us hope. Next time the devil tries to get after you to say to yourself, I might just be God's secret weapon. I can't pull the trigger right now. But my, when my God says pull the trigger, I'm going to and heaven's going to move and you're going down, sucker. Okay? Oh, I love the story of Esther. In fact, I wrote one as we were, as we were getting up here and Randy was reading his poem. Here Mordecai was the bitter enemy of Haman. Refused to bow. But also during that time, he brought a plot to poison the king to the king's attention and save the king's life. And so now here is Haman. He's got everything in place. And he's, I, I just can't wait for the day to come. I get to slaughter all the Jews. And the king calls him in and says, Haman, there's this guy I want to I wanna, I wanna honor. What do you think I ought to do? Well, you ought to put on a royal robe on him that you've worn in public, and you ought to put him on one of your steeds, and you ought to have them go through town saying, this is what the king does for someone that, he was, that, he, that pleases him. And I can see Haman, I'm going to get paraded down the streets. I'm the number one guy besides the king. I'm going to get a royal robe, not just a princely robe, but a royal robe. And about the time he can see himself in his head, going down the, the, the lanes. 
in Babylon, the king says, good, why don't you go ahead and do all that for Mordecai, would you please? <laughs> when you're walking with God, the God can promote you in spite of the enemy. <laughs> I mean, just rubbing it in his face. I mean, though, I think it was after that that Haman decided to go ahead and build some nooses out in front of his house because he wanted one to dangle with Mordecai on it. He had had enough. This, this Jew was a pain in his backside that he had tolerated and he could not tolerate it any longer. But if you read the story, who hung from that noose? Mordecai. Not Mordecai. Haman, this thing if you're paying attention. Everybody went. <laughs> Crunch time in the kingdom. Esther's response to the challenge of Mordecai we find in Esther 4, starting in verse 15. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. <coughs> Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither, drink, neither eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maidens and I will fast likewise. And I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Why is that so strategic? What reflection do we have of that in the New Testament? We find it in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12. There's an interesting transition where Satan is thrown out of the second heaven. The Bible says he's come down with great wrath because he knows his time is short. But what precedes that is all of a sudden God's people start going before the court of the Lord and said, Do you see what this guy's doing? How long are you going to wait? And then the Word of God makes an interesting statement. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that they did not love their lives to the death. Basically, Esther did the same thing. She was standing on her blood covenant. And her testimony was, if I live, I live. If I die, I die. Kind of like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, she refused to bow. But this word testify, when you read it, when you read the original Greek word, it means to stand before a judge in a court to make your complaint. That there's three things that the remnant are going to do in the last days, they're going to be so established that they live a life that keeps their life under the blood. No disobedience. In fellowship, real fellowship with Jesus, 1 John chapter 1 tells us that if I remain in that fellowship, that the blood of Jesus continually cleanses me of all sin. 24-7, 365, baby. You see, that's so important because when we step outside the blood is where the enemy can hit us. So they had learned to walk in purity and holiness, and it created great problems for the enemy. Secondly, we see in the scene in the verses before that, that they're giving testimony before the great judge, El Elyon the great judge of heaven before his court, and says, look at what he's doing. How long will you tarry? I think there's going to be a new dimension to intercessory prayer like we have never seen before, that there's going to be prophetic utterances given in the prayer closet, prophetic declarations, because the intercessors are beginning to learn how to stand in the court of the Lord. You cannot do it in arrogance. You cannot do it in the flesh. you got to appear before the court, and you better be reflecting Jesus from one end to the other you got to pray as Jesus would pray in that situation. You can't do it in the flesh. It's got to be done by the Spirit. And when we do, we're going to see a whole generation of intercessors that will turn the tide of darkness so that we can have revival in the last days. And the final thing is they loved not their lives unto death. They did exactly what Hadessa did, Esther did. 
I'm going to do this thing because it's what God is requiring of me. I have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And if I perish, I perish. If I live, I live. That's in the hands of God. But I'm going to be obedient. We always talk about the great miracles. We read through the book of Acts and it's like, God was doing stuff, wasn't he? They pray and the whole building shakes. And it wasn't because they were on a fault line either. It wasn't because of fracking for oil. The power of God hit that place. Paul went down to Iconium. They stoned him to death. The disciples gather around him and pray. Paul gets up. And then the next day, he goes back to Iconium to preach. It's like, didn't we just kill you yesterday? Why do we see things like that? Because they were on the front lines, and it was literally day in and day out. I will obey the Lord. If I live, I live. If I perish, I perish. That was the, because they had the Jewish people on one side wanting to kill them, and they had the Romans on the other side wanting to kill them. How I many know that left them no place to hide except in the arms of God? And if we want to be a New Testament church like we see in the book of Acts, you got to love Jesus more than your life. Well, Mike, what happens if you go out here and you obey God and you get killed? I just got promoted. Now, I don't want stupidity to send me to heaven earlier. But if I'm going to die, I want it to be an act of obedience. Come on. Now, I'm standing on the word that, that he can give me 70, or by strength, 80 years. Or like I heard one preacher say, you get a testimony, and you just draw that bad boy out just as long as you can, you know. I figure when I, when I can't write books anymore because I, I, I don't have any ideas, I'm going to be swallowing kind of hard, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling my testimony about to run out here. But guys, we, we got to love Jesus more. That was, that was a distinctive of the early church. But you see, it was at the point of that kind of audacity, the audacity of faith, that miracles happen. That's when you're going to see the dead raised. That's when you're going to see the blind see. That's when you're going to see the deaf hear. That's when you're going to see the lame walk. I, I'm, I'm expecting in the days ahead, I want to see one man, one woman anointed of God, go in and clear out a hospital and tell the news media, explain that. Go ahead and explain it. Spontaneous remission of every disease in this place within one hour. Just as fast as I could go from room to room. And it all is because of the name of Jesus. Let them try to figure out a way of explaining that. Somebody sent out a healing bomb. We're not quite sure what caused this wake of healing. I can't wait because that's going to make Jesus glorified. As well as somebody prophetically speaking God's judgment over the deep state and seeing them become like, Her like King Agrippa, like Herod, that their sin manifests and the judgment hits and they're no more. How many know that when there's no bullet, there's no poison, there's no way of explaining it except the judgment of God hit? It's going to get these people that thought they're beyond power, they're beyond reach, attention. I think we're going to see that in the days to come. One of my favorite verses, guys, in Esther is Esther 7.10. After Haman is caught, And so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath was subdued. You see, it doesn't matter what weapon the enemy has formed against you. He can fall in the snare that he has prepared for you. He can fall in the trap that he has set for you. That his own witty ways will become his own demise when we walk with God. Did you know that you could have you can have a minefield of situations the enemy has planted in front of you and the Holy Spirit of God can hit you and you can dance through a minefield and get on the other side because he guides your every step. 
Now, Mary will tell you just, just about me. Now, she would probably have enough sense to go around the minefield, but while she has sat in awe, in my stupidity, there have been a few minefields that I have danced through, and the grace of God got me to the other side without a big boom. You see, our God is bigger than what the enemy can do. God's ability to bless you is greater than the enemy's ability to steal from you. Come on now. And the enemy has his comeuppance coming. Now for the younger generation, that I remember the first time I used the word comeuppance, everybody had to look it up in the dictionary. They thought I made up a word because it's an older English word. It means everything that you sowed, you're getting ready to reap, and it's going to come in one big ball. But at the same time, guys, there's been a lot of us that have been faithful day in and day out, and we didn't realize that God was actually holding back the harvest because he's very strategic. He wants to release it at one time just to show his power in the face of the enemy. That's the story of Purim. How many know the Antichrist when he gets into the Valley of Armageddon? And I believe that's actually kind of a mistranslation. It's actually going to be somewhere else rather than the, the, the plains of Megiddo. But how many know where that battle hits? The last thing the Antichrist is thinking as he, go, as he goes into that is, I'm about to die. He says, I have finally got to the place where I can win. It will be the greatest army planet Earth has ever seen. It will have a transeugenic horde that would actually blow the minds of Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. They're going to have technological advances beyond, beyond our imagination. But the Bible says all Jesus has to do is speak a word. Just speak a word. They forgot that he spoke everything into existence. Everything. John tells us in John chapter 1 that, that in the beginning he was with God and he was, was God and everything that was created was created by him. You know, when you read in the Hebrew, and I love what the rabbis, because it's <clears throat> when God says light be, it's in the act of perpetual tense. It has the idea that if God would ever pull that back, light would stop. That creation would stop. That's why in the New Testament we find that he says that it's, it's upheld by the word of his power. We're here today because God's still enforcing that word. But you know what? He can say, that one, that one, that one, and that one, I take it all back. You think they have power in, with the affinity goblet, or, you know, whatever they call that thing, with the affinity stones to rewrite reality? The only one who can rewrite reality is the one who created it. He doesn't need any, any power stones. He is the power that watches over us. Doesn't have to snap his fingers. He just has to say the word. One of my favorite book, one of my favorite verses in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet cries out to God and says, save us and we shall be saved. Heal us and we shall be healed. All God needs to do to change your situation is to speak a word. And creation itself must yield to that word. How many know he did it for Esther? placed her strategically where the enemy didn't even know she was until God pulled the trigger on his trap. There are things that God has hidden in your life that the enemy can't see. He can't see at all. He can't understand. Or like L.A. Marzulli would say, Almighty God has obfuscated like they're doing with the UFOs, the government's obfuscating the reality. No matter how hard the enemy looks, he can't see 
what God's getting ready to do in you and through you and by you. We just have to have a pure heart before him and walk with him. Now, Father, I ask today in the name of Jesus for every remnant, Father, that you would give us the desire to walk humbly before you, to walk in purity, to walk in holiness, so that the devil could have nothing in us. Father, to set the fire of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us like never before, so that he can burn out the chaff, burn out the bondage, and that we can walk free, and that we can be your weapons of kingdom power and destiny in the last days. And Father, we trust you and we thank you for it today. In Jesus' name. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand the Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.